Welcome back, everyone, to the PXP Let's Talk Success podcast. Take two on this one. We actually just had a walk-in uh, come in, which is pretty cool. Paul, you want to say anything about that? Yeah, it's, it's awesome. And that's, that's what usually happens. People walk in the door, um, say, hey, what goes on in here? And then they walk in and they start looking around and um, they usually have a, their eyes opened because we do things differently here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's always fun to see someone that's motivated. I don't... I don't know if it's because I don't feel motivated right now, like in this moment or what, but it's always nice seeing that. Well, we're going to have to get some uh, whips and chains out here and get you all motivated. No, I mean, I'm, I'm motivated physically <laughs> and goal-wise. I just, not in this particular moment. I'm chill in this moment yeah. for the podcast. It's been a little dreary. It's been cold. It's starting to warm up a little bit. Right. It is cold in here, even though it's like almost 60 degrees outside, but I feel cold. But I am wearing shorts, so I got yelled at yesterday by my cryotherapy people about wearing shorts. So, But anyways, how are you, how are you feeling this morning? Oh, very good. Absolutely. Good. How was your Christmas? Oh, wonderful. Um, it was great. Obviously, it was cold for everybody. We had those, that really cold um, mm-hmm. yeah. front that came through. and. Uh, like many other people, it, it kind of messed up with some plans. Uh, had plans to, to see mom and, and my sisters and so forth and their families. And uh, the roads weren't very good up there. They had some uh, emergency mm. uh, vehicles only warning up there when we wanted to go up. So uh, we'll catch up with them here in a, another week okay. or so. You didn't bring out the snowmobile? I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> the skis. Everybody's skiing <laughs> right now. I don't, I don't ski. You won't catch me on skis. Um, how was your swim this morning? Oh, it was fantastic. A little, little yeah. dry land swimming. Did a little uh, Zen 8, getting some uh, tubes out and some tubing out and, and working yeah. on some form and technique stuff. Paul was playing with his new toy, everyone. Uh, <laughs> I, I asked him if he wanted me to dump water on him, but he said no. So he's no fun today. You know, after Panama City, I, we don't have enough salt water. Uh, I, we, can, <laughs> hey, we can make that happen. I we could do either. I've got to be blocks careful what salt. I ask for. Right? Yeah, I was going to say, we can do blocks of salt. I can mix in salt like a deer, uh-huh. like deer hunting. Or... <laughs> All right, let's go to uh, Cricket's joke. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed the last joke. The last joke is actually on our story as of today. This podcast will come out on New Year's Day. Um, but my, my Jolly Rancher flavor is winning right now. <laughs> so we'll see what the final results are, but my uh-huh. flavor is winning. So I think it's, uh, I have the blue, ra- so it's blue raspberry as a flavor. It's uh-huh. not blue. Uh-huh. Um, and then there's cherry and watermelon and green apple. Watermelon and green apple have votes right now, but yours does not, cherry. Oh, Your boy. Your cherry does not. But we'll see. It's, it's uh, only been a couple hours. That just means more for me. Hey, that's true. That is true. <laughs> All right, Craig's joke this time. Um, do you know what day it is? Do you know what day is a little more sad than Sunday? No. Saturday. <laughs> so I, I like that one. That was a good one that she sent me. So there you go, Cricket. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Hopefully you're laughing at, there at home. All right, let's go into today's topic, everyone. Today's topic is going to be a, a cool one. It's going to be run form. So we're going to talk about that just because, well, one, because Paul wants to, and that's what's going to be on the... Um... <laughs> I like how you think there. Whatever I want, right? <laughs> right. So that's what... Uh, and that's going to be the educational piece on the um, newsletter. So we'll go with that. But I just, it's cool to me because of how different, uh, of how different it was to what I was doing as opposed to what everyone might be thinking. So we'll go ahead and get into it. What, um, what do you want to talk about first? Well, let's, let's, let's start here over at a little bit over, more of an overview on this. So it's, mm-hmm. um, we just started 2023. Everybody mm-hmm. that, um, has an interest in running um, as soon as that magical time comes January 1 or the, the New Year's come everybody starts looking at starting a training plan for their running mm-hmm. okay, so this will be a good time to start talking about some running forms, some tips uh, uh, some thoughts to go on there. From a coaching perspective probably the most important thing I can do is teach my athletes why they're running fast okay, okay? It's not so much that they are running fast, but why are they running fast? Okay. Is it their cadence? Is it their stride length? Is it their vertical oscillation? Do they have the right stride length for them? And, and conversely, if they're not running as fast as they want to run, why is that? Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, maybe it is fitness. Maybe it is a, a bunch of uh, physiology things there that are happening. But uh, it's not so much why they're. Uh, it's not so much that they're running fast, but why are they running fast? 
then if we can figure out what the limiters are to that then and tweak those a little bit everything just keeps moving right along and we continue to get PRs year after year after year because we're fine-tuning those those things yeah absolutely so I don't know um, where do you want to where do you want to start with that if you want to start with from the head down or what do you want to initially go with um, well, let, when we think about running yeah let, let's stay out a little bit more here so okay you know the, the first thing to think about when you're running is uh, you know what is your aerobic capacity right now right okay and so if you haven't been running in the last month you know you got to be careful about how you start that running program a lot, a lot of these training plans that you may see uh, are making some assumptions that you've got a certain base fitness does your base fitness match up with that mm -hmm. uh, so that's the aerobic piece of it uh, the second is you know how fast are you how fast can you run how uh, how is your anaerobic system or that that speed system working and then third component with this is what are your biomechanics you mm -hmm. know do you have any limiters you know, it, you know are you limited by a strength issue a right to left imbalance and asymmetry do you have a flexibility issue and so I would start with everybody of where are you at in those three components mm -hmm. if, if you're good on on the aerobic side and not as good on the anaerobic side and you have good biomechanics then it becomes pretty easy to say hey we need to we can start uh, more aggressively with some speed work if you have poor biomechanics that supersedes everything and we've got to figure out what those biomechanics are and how we improve those biomechanics by biomechanics what are you looking at there so that could be everything from you know my uh, hamstrings might be tight mm -hmm. I might have tight hip flexors so I can't get into the uh, appropriate positions um, if we're going to try to define bi biomechanics it, it's really simple it's, it's how well that your body's moving mechanically mm -hmm. right and how efficient is it moving what's your form all those pieces a lot of people want to uh, will come in and ask me hey I'd like to get a gait analysis yeah and I watch them walk in and they've got this slight limp or the you know, stride length is a little different as they're just walking it's so a lot of times I encourage them not to do the gait analysis <laughs> yet because it, what's going to happen is that um, I'm gonna look at their gait I'm gonna mm -hmm. tell them that's not very efficient that they got some asymmetries but they're not gonna be able to fix it because mechanically they've got a right and left imbalance mm -hmm. a right and left asymmetry they've got a muscle that's not firing you've got motor pattern sequence firing that's off uh, maybe the uh, uh, they've got a muscle that's just not working mm -hmm. you know, because some of their habits and so we fix those first and then watch how they run okay you know, it, it's it becomes more uh, a more efficient situation of you know they can actually work on the mechanics if they don't have the asymmetries yeah right well what it sounds like is um, to me is that you're preparing them for the test I feel like what um, just how I'm listening to this right now is that they want to come in and take the test without doing uh, without doing any maybe. studying right maybe, maybe so, they have studied or, right? or, or yeah so. maybe, maybe they have studied and they're, and they're ready for it and a lot of people a lot of times they'll come in and, and we'll have that conversation and and they'll be like well let's just see where I'm at anyway mm -hmm. okay great and so we'll look at the uh, the video uh, of this uh, this gate and we'll talk about what's happening and then the important piece is what's the cause right you know we want to see the effect obviously but can they fix the cause mm -hmm. or should we fix the cause yeah you know not every not every uh, uh, imbalance or, or every every imperfect form piece needs to be corrected mm -hmm. okay. well, so can you give me an example of that by chance yeah. so um, for a long time everybody was talking about uh, heel striking's bad mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people heel strike well if they're over striding if they're over striding yes that's bad mm -hmm. you know it's there's some force correlations on there that you know we don't want to have but if they're not over striding and they're simply hitting their heel first that's not necessarily bad because the foot's still hitting underneath of you it's just the heels making contact first mm -hmm. so there's not as much force going on and there's actually some newer research coming out to suggest that heel striking is not as bad as what many people have let it out to be mm -hmm. if you don't have an injury pattern if you're not if you've not been hurt and you've been doing this consistently and you are heel striking why should you change it why should I yeah I mean, so that, that would become the question <laughs> if it's not broke why fix it you're right right uh -huh. just because everybody else says hey heel striking's inefficient mm -hmm. it might be efficient for you or it might be something that 
uh, is the least of your challenges if, if we're looking at your overall piece. Okay. So, you know, as we're looking at all of this, you know, the summary piece is, you know, from a superficial level, we've got to make sure that your aerobic capacity is appropriate as you get started. Mm -hmm. Do you have good biomechanics? And then what is your speed or turnover or cadence? What, what does that look like? If you've got those three in line, then you get to go deeper. Mm -hmm. Then we start looking a little bit deeper in the physiology of um, what's your heart rate? Yeah. Can, can you actually train in a, a zone two? Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people, they'll uh, go out in that aerobic uh, zone or be encouraged to go out in that aerobic zone, and they go out and they start a slow jog and their heart rate spikes, yeah. and they can't get it to go lower, and, and they'll use words like, well, I have to walk to keep my heart rate in that zone. I'm like, well, okay, we'll go walk. Right. But your heart rate's still working in that same intensity level um, you just don't have a, a fast pace. Um, okay. We can start looking at what your uh, overall strength is, mm -hmm. what your overall flexibility is, what your lactate tolerance is, uh, what your respiratory rate, how, how, many, how much oxygen do you, do you need to come in to, to do that sort of thing? How quickly can you recover from, from pieces? And then as we get past that, then we really want to see what your capacity is like. And that's where we get into the real training, the deeper level. So there's several levels to look at in terms of getting the body prepared for training. Okay. Right? And again, I just want to go over that real quick. You got the superficial level one where you're looking at, you know, how much have you been running recently? What, what's your fitness level? What's your conditioning? What's your tolerance to this piece? And what's your, and, and that would include your aerobic and anaerobic sides of that. And then what's your biomechanics? Mm -hmm. If you don't have biomechanics, don't risk the other pieces because you're going to get hurt. Maybe not this week, maybe not this month, but it's going to happen when you have that biomechanical piece going on. You get those fixed, then we get into the training stuff, the physiology, where we're looking at the lactate and the respiratory rate and the heart rate and the tolerance to, to lactate and how much strength do you have and do you have the right amount of flexibility and all that kind of stuff. And then we get deeper into the training where we're looking at uh, do we need to uh, push one energy system more than the other, other energy system to make you a balanced runner. Mm -hmm. And do you, so my, I guess my first question is, do you start this process, um, I know it's not the same, but the same with everyone per se, like this initial. The process is the same, where they yeah. enter is at different places, right? Okay. So if you've got a, if you've got a new or a novice runner, mm -hmm. you start the very basic beginning and then start that piece. If you've got somebody that's been running for a period of time, I still start them there, but sometimes I can uh, just do that as a summary and then yeah. pull them forward a little faster. And so it's it's a similar process for everybody, but they go through it at different rates. Okay, cool. And then does distance matter for that as well? Uh, Where they like jump into the training, I guess? Well, no, the training is based on, on them. I mean, so mm -hmm. if you're asking, you know, do you start them out running two miles or 10 miles? Right. Well, sure, that's really based on what their history has been and what mm -hmm. their aerobic capacity is right now and what their biomechanics can tolerate and that sort of thing but it's the same process. You're building everybody up. You build everybody up based on where they're at. Gotcha, okay. I just didn't know if like someone is training for a 5K versus a half marathon, if you start that, if you start the, um, I don't know, interval training faster or more speed work faster than you would for someone with a, that's doing I, a I don't half think marathon. you start it faster. I think that you do it differently for both. So speed work mm -hmm. for a marathon runner versus a 5K runner are, are two different things. So speed mm -hmm. work for a marathon runner might be mile repeats, where speed work for a 5K is 200 meter repeats mm -hmm. or 400 meter repeats, quarter mile repeats, that sort of thing. Um, but you start them at similar places based on where they're at and what they can tolerate. Okay, awesome. So I can go, we can go in a few different, we can go a few different ways here. I don't know if you want to walk someone through like um, the process, the running process, and how you would get started with them, which I think we should probably do. Or I have a question that I want to answer. So we can, I can answer my question. We can answer my question later, and we'll yeah. get to it this way. I yeah. think. So the process. I mean, if somebody comes in, and you know, that first level, you know, uh, really becomes a dialogue. Mm -hmm. now, how much have you been running? What What have you been running? What What's your heart rate been like? What's your recovery? How long does it take you to? complete that distance. You know, some mm -hmm. people <clears throat> run by time, some people run by distance, some people run by uh, other measures of intensity, that sort of thing. And then how frequently are they running? Um, how intensely are they running? How long does it take them to recover? Uh, you know, that dialogue goes into 
giving me a good flavor for where they're at. Okay. And then, you know, experience comes into this. I mean, there's not a specific recipe, but you, after doing this a number of years, you, you kind of get a, a good feel for where they're at and, and where your next step is. The next step for me is if they've got that under control, is doing a functional movement screen. We've talked about the functional movement screen before. I, I use that for my coaching. I use that in strength classes. I use that as a foundation for everything we do because we need to see what the body's doing. And so this is where we pick up on that biomechanic stuff. Mm -hmm. um, if they can't stand on one leg and, and be balanced, most likely when they're running, they're going to be even more unstable. And yep. that instability comes out in a lot of different ways. The ankle doesn't move the same way. Your pelvis drops. Your you can't maintain your appropriate posture. All those things slow you down. All those things contribute to your risk of injury. And so I want to know the biomechanics of what can they do in a more static environment, standing in here, and how will that translate into a dynamic environment running on the road or running on the trails? Mm -hmm. And just a quick question with that. When, when we say that, so how does that work with sports versus running? because you know we have a lot of people who come in here that play s different sports and whatnot and they don't necessarily run but they are running in that activity whether whether it be soccer football lacrosse um, volleyball whatnot how does that why is that important for that stuff? yeah i think that you know stepping away from running just for a second we're looking mm -hmm. at all the other sports all the other sports use this movement or this activity um, that's a foundation that we're talking about for running in their sport. Mm -hmm. They just apply some power to it, or they apply some, you know, we're gonna use the word speed, agility, quickness. Uh, those words uh, are, are important to sport, but if you can't stabilize, you can't be quick. If mm -hmm. you can't stabilize, you're not as agile. If you can't stabilize, you can't get as much power. Okay. Okay. So you know, I, I see a lot of people come in and say, hey, would you work on, on my son or daughter's speed and agility? Mm -hmm. And I. Kind of look at them, I smile, I nod my head, yes. Mm -hmm. And and what they're thinking is, is ladder drills and quick feed and yeah. you know, a lot of jumping and that kind of stuff. And where I start them at is, is getting all this stuff to work first and make sure it's firing in the right sequence, just like what we're talking about for running. Mm -hmm. And then we can progress them into those things once they've got that foundation done. Okay. So uh, I guess a more direct uh, answer for you is it's very similar no matter what sport, what, what activity you're doing. I got you. You just. Um... Had, had me hit a flashback real quick because you, you said quick feet and I remember like <laughs> um, quick feet or fire feet from f um, football mm -hmm. and I hated it so much um, so you just triggered that <laughs> a little so memory. I you a flashback of some really bad times. Yeah, some trauma right there. Yeah, <laughs> just, those are the worst. Well maybe if we did all this other stuff in your, in your, uh, and you were more symmetric and more solid like you are now you would have loved it. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> Uh, I guess we'll never know unless we do it in here. Then I guess well, we might know. Just so, don't give me ideas. We'll have that right. Idea. Yeah. Six a.m. is going to be mad at me when we start doing it. It's a fire feature. Let's... Well, they don't know, but that's part of what's coming for them. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. Let's move on from. Um, let's. Well, let's move forward from there. I guess. So once we got that functional movement screen and we, we've identified that the right side or the left side is less stable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we got to figure out why that is. So mm -hmm. if they're standing on one foot and and the pelvis drops on the opposite side or, um, or they just aren't as stable and they feel less stable, figure out why that is. Is it because the muscle's not firing? Is it because it's not the same strength, so we got a muscle strength imbalance? Is it because they don't have the flexibility? Mm -hmm. We identify that cause and then we give them homework yeah. that they would work on to correct that cause. And then in here we call that your maintenance and or flexibility. So at the end of every class, um, most everybody in here has gone through a functional movement screen. They know what their limiters are. In the final 15, 10 to 15 minutes of every class, they have that opportunity to work on that maintenance of yeah. what they need to do. For sure. Um, each of those pieces then would contribute to, to their mechanics of sport. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna you know, try to keep it focused on running here. Right. But the mechanics of their sport, the mechanics of running uh, are limited by that asymmetry, limited mm -hmm. by that imbalance. And if we can equal those out, you've got a great upside. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's just, there's and there's so many little things in my opinion, um, well, I mean, that's just what it is. There, and because you'll see, I'll see so many different people working on so many different things and I have my own things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and that's just such a big deal to do it 
more often too, I guess, because so I have my training in the morning, obviously, but then last night, um, for instance, I was um, putting one of our new uh, athletes through uh, the flexibility and maintenance for her probably and if you didn't know an 11 year old is more flexible than me uh, so <laughs> I'll just let you know that piece of that um, but it's it's just so critical because there's just so many things to work on that help me, help me out there and other people out there you know mm -hmm. so um, going from there I guess like after when we're working on our maintenance and stuff what how does that translate outside so it, you hit a bunch of different pieces there. Yeah. So one of the cautions that we have is as you see someone else doing something, so you think you need to do that. Mm -hmm. So that might be true. Right. But if you don't know that for sure, if we haven't gone through this process, then sometimes it's a, it's a, a detriment to you. Mm -hmm. One of the mistakes I see people make is they go online or they go to wherever they get their information and they read about run form. Mm -hmm. And they think that they've got to have that same run form or, or that article is trying to describe perfect run form and they try to go from wherever they're at to whatever that perfection form looks like many times i think that's a mistake yeah. because you're correcting too many things you're trying to make too big of a jump and, and it might not be what's best for you mm -hmm. okay so i want to caution everybody as you're as, as i'm talking to you don't don't take my word for what I'm going to talk about here in terms of form and technique is what you need to try to emulate. Mm -hmm. Some of these pieces, if it helps you run faster, then great. Right. If it makes you feel more stressed or tired or put you at risk for injury, well, that's silly. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we've got to figure out how to put all these pieces together and so forth. So don't take my word for it. Don't take what you read online of what you need to do. Everything that I'm going to try to talk about, and, and, I, and I'm to give them the benefit of the doubt of what people talk about online is uh, uh, these are things that can help people be more efficient these are things that can help reduce the risk of injury you've got to figure out if it's the right thing for you no yeah absolutely i always tell people that's why i hate when people ask me of, um, about my training and what my what my workout was and what i'm doing i'm like don't copy me i was like don't, don't do that because it, like you said, it might not be good for you. And I, I always tell them, well, I always tell them, talk to you about what, <laughs> about what they need to do, right? Because like, like you said, they might not have an issue that I have. Um, so I'm working on it out, out um, and after class, that doesn't mean I'm out working you, that means I got something going on, right? And I'm just trying to work on it. So yeah, that's very important. And then that reminded me of, so I was listening to a podcast yesterday, which I usually don't do, but Sarah Galvin, shout out to Sarah Galvin. She was on the last podcast. If you haven't listened to the last podcast, go listen to it. She drops a bunch of gems in there. But um, it was a podcast with, I don't remember the guy's name, but I remember the coach's name. They were interviewing Mike Smith for NAU. That's their coach, I believe. Um, and they win. For those, of, for those of the listeners that don't know who he is, they um, win a bunch of cross country championships. Um, but he said, if you were do if you're doing something that someone else isn't doing, then you're in the right place. And you just hinted at that, I believe. So, yeah. you know, not to compare, not to compare you, like we just said not to do, but you know, he said that. Yeah. Um, so that just reminded me of it. Yeah. The more you can be individualized by what your body needs and what, where mm -hmm. you're at in this moment and, and focus on that, the better off you are. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's go. Um, yeah, so if we're going to, let's let's break down the run. And mm -hmm. again, um, I want you to hear these pieces. And if it's something that that uh, that you might change, great. But put it into the bigger context. Don't just change something to change something. So the first thing that I, where I go over with people is is their body position, their stance, their drive face, you know, that push off, mm -hmm. that propulsion uh, area. What you've got to be able to do um, to run faster is cover more ground, mm -hmm. right? So the more you can push off, the harder you push off, the more you propel your body forward, further forward, you cover more ground. Yep. I've used this analogy a lot, but if, if we use 2,000 steps as an average that we would take in a mile, if I can get an extra half inch of propulsion per stride, I've now gained 1,000 inches. Right. Okay. And 1,000 inches divided by 12 is 90-something feet. 
So for every mile that I run, if I get that, I just caught and passed everybody that was within 90 feet of me. Mm -hmm. And that translates into you know, 15 to 30 seconds, depending on, on what's going on for most people. And so that, that drive space, that drive force, that drive phase is, is a key component to running faster. Yeah. But you simply pushing off harder behind you doesn't always translate into good, efficient run form. Right. Right. Because some people would try to do that and they're going to be sprinting and you're not going to be able to do that for as long. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we've got to get that with more flexibility. Sometimes we've got to get the muscles stronger. Sometimes we've got to actually just change the mechanics of how you push off. Right. Okay. So your body position is important. There's all, there should be a forward lean mm -hmm. um, about 10 degrees from your ankle to your shoulder. So if your foot's planted on the ground and, and you look at your Achilles, there should be a straight line from your shoulders down to that heel with a body lean of about 10 degrees. That number, I'm making it up if you go look at a bunch of different places. <coughs> excuse me. If you're jogging, you're going to be more vertical. Mm -hmm. So that becomes a lower number. Yeah. If you're sprinting, you're going to be leaning further forward. That mm -hmm. becomes a bigger number. Yeah. So it has everything to do with your pace. And so if somebody says it needs to be specifically 10 degrees, mm -hmm. as I just use that number as a general thing, it may or may not be your lane because of how fast or how much power you're using, right? So right. the faster you go in general, the further that body lane should be, mm -hmm. the slower you're going, the more vertical you're going to be. Okay. okay? Now the and danger with having a vertical position mm -hmm. is that when you push off the ground, you're going to push yourself up into the air. Yep. So now you're not you know, reaching out as far, you're going up higher. Mm -hmm. And the higher you go, you've got to land. Yeah. So that vertical oscillation is what causes the, some injuries, puts you at more risk for causing injuries. Mm -hmm. If you're pushing back and propelling your body further forward, you don't have as much vertical oscillation. There's not as much force landing on the ground. You don't have to overcome gravity as much. And so it's more efficient and you get to go faster. Mm -hmm. Is there a sweet spot with that vertical oscillation? Is there like a general range? Yeah, lower, you should is, be in. lower is better. And again, okay. just like that body lane, mm -hmm. just like that body lane, your pace has a lot to do with that. So, yeah, you know, I got you. It's going to be really hard to jog and have a very low vertical oscillation. Mm -hmm. okay. Got you. Yeah. So I'm going to say something that I saw the other day, and then I'm going to ask you a question. The thing I saw the other day was I saw a gr I was on um, the elliptical actually. I think this was ac actually like two weeks ago. I saw a girl. Um, running on a treadmill at the at a different gym that I go to and she was like jumping and jumping I'm like oh man I was like I want to say something but I don't want to be that guy that tries to be a know-it-all or whatever but it was killing me so, so, so. she was like a gazelle just kind of mm -hmm. she kind was of yeah she she was like pew, pew, mm -hmm. pew. Um, but so the serious question is <laughs> where does that lean where should that lean come from comes out of your ankles mm -hmm. uh, so again, if, if your foot makes contact with the ground and it's sitting flat, mm -hmm. and then you flex forward at the ankle joint or through the Achilles, from that point there at your heel up through your shoulders, your body should be in a straight line or a straight-ish line. Okay. Um, so you're not flexing at the hips. And why not? Yeah. Well, that's inefficient. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> what, so what does it do though? So that's the main thing. So mm -hmm. the more that your body is in a linear position or a straight line position, yeah. the more solid okay. you are. Mm -hmm. And the more solid you are, all the forces you put into the ground get to be used to propel you forward. I got you. So if you're broken at the hips or you're leaning forward at the hips, you're not a steel rod anymore. Mm -hmm. You've got a little bit of wiggliness, wiggle, wiggliness that's happening and you're losing power. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. So the more streamlined that your body is, the, the straighter that your body is, from your heel through your shoulder, the more likely your core is that engaged the more likely you're using your glutes, the more likely that you've got your shoulder blades active, the more likely that you're not twisting, and you've got good form. So that's why we start here about your body position, your stance and your drive phase, because everything that we're gonna talk, talk about next would really be modifying or trying to change your mechanics to become a better efficient position of what we just talked about. Yeah, and that, um... that's just critical because, so I asked that because when I was prepping for the podcast, podcast earlier I saw on a website that it said to lean at the hip I was like 
I don't, I'm pretty sure we're not supposed to do that. And so that's why I asked. Yeah, that would so. be one of those things where I would um, look at it, smile, nod, and go, I wonder why they're saying that. Because maybe mm -hmm. they've got some uh, correction that they're doing or doing some sort of training mm -hmm. because of other mechanical things going on. Yeah. Um, but as a general rule, no, don't flex mm -hmm. your hands. Well, yeah, that, and that's why I wrote it down to ask you because I wanted other people to hear that. Um, but okay, so once we go from there, once we, we understand our body position and foundation, yep. where do we go from? Yeah, let's start, let's start at your head. Two. So your head position should be right over top of your shoulders, right? Mm -hmm. your, your chin's not stuck out. You know, I see a lot of people running where they, they got the chin stuck out, their head's looking up, they're, they're almost looking down their nose out in front of them uh, when they're running. I mean, other people that their head has dropped so far that they're looking down at their toes, they're looking mm -hmm. straight down at their feet. That, those two extremes of your head position aren't where it needs to be, right? Okay, yeah. yeah. So if we think about that straight line, that streamlined position from your heels up through your shoulders, that head needs to be a continuation of that same line. Mm -hmm. It's not tipped back, it's not dropped forward, it's not tilted to the side, it's just nice and solid up there. Mm -hmm. In general, now if we, from that, now we'll look at your eyes. If you stick your arms straight out and it's horizontal, you know, and, and you're just standing or sitting there, uh, if you're vertical, you're upright. Mm -hmm. If you stick it out at nine degrees of parallel to the floor, drop that about 10 degrees, and that should be the angle that your eyes are following out front of you. And so in general, you're looking at about 20 to 30 feet in front of you is where your eyes should be looking. You know, you're not looking up, you're not looking two miles down the road, you're not looking down and seeing where your feet are making contact with the ground. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, I'm going to put an asterisk ne next to that last statement. You might want to look at the ground if you're running trails. Well, yeah. But, and, <laughs> yeah. and looking at roots and you got to jump over stuff, you know, you're going to drop your head just a little bit more so you can mm -hmm. see where your feet are landing and that sort of thing. Or if it's, you know, uh, dark outside or, or you know, icy some other, some icy for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so again, you know, all these things, you take them and you apply, apply them to the environment that you're in. But in a, you're running a flat course, you're, you don't have obstacles in your way, it's not icy, not slick. You're, you're really trying to look about 20 to 30 feet in front of you, and that's all you really care about. Okay, awesome. So what what am I doing if my head is moving? Like, what, what so not like body-wise, what am I doing, but what am I limiting myself to? Yeah, so if your head's bobbling side to side, mm -hmm. you know, how many times have you seen it? Go to a track meet and watch mm -hmm. people run, and you'll see a head bobble side to side, or you'll see their chin tucked out, and they're running mm -hmm. with their chest way yeah. up, and they're hyperextended, or, or, or they're slouched over, and their head's dropping down. Those three positions are inefficient on your running. So inefficient meaning that it's it's slowing you down, mm -hmm. right? If I'm running and my head's way up tall, yeah. I, I can't push off very well, right? Right. If I'm hunched over and I'm leaning forward, I can't run as well, but I'm also not be able to get as much air into my lungs. Right, right. If my head's going side to side, that's not helping me propel forward. Mm -hmm. That's shifting me off the side that I've got, I've got to use energy to try to stabilize the lower half of my body. Right. Okay. So each of those might be how that person runs, mm -hmm. might be how that person feels best running, but it also might be a, con a contributing factor that's slowing them down or limiting them. Right. You know, my comment that we talked about earlier, it's you know, that person could be running really fast, mm -hmm. but could they run faster right. if they didn't have that head bobble or if they put their head in a better position? Yep, absolutely. Right. No, I've seen and, it. And so yeah, if they're running really fast and winning everything, why change it, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, I would tell you to put those things into uh, perspective of what's happening to that person, to you in that situation and in yeah. that scenario. Yeah, no, absolutely, I agree with that for sure. Then, so we start. We are we going to our shoulders, head, shoulders, knees, and toes? Knees nope, and we're toes. going to jump. So once once I've got your body uh, in terms of like its propulsion, where, where uh, you're not overstriding, you've got a good lean. I've got your head in the right position, and I go straight down to the foot. Okay. The foot in contact with the ground is really the only thing that is going to be uh, a true force to propel you forward, right? Mm -hmm. yep. There's nothing else that's moving you forward right. except for your foot contact with the ground. Yep. <clears throat> so if we got your body in the right position, we got your head in the right position, you're able to push off, you've got some good symmetry going on. Let's go down and look at what really is doing your propulsion, which is your foot strike where your center of gravity hits where, where all this happens and then talk about it so where should your foot strike relative to your center of mass 
Do you want me to answer that? Uh, I want to see if you know the answer, yeah. Yeah, um, but so behind your knee, um, below your hip. Yeah, okay. Um, right Close under to your, your hip. Right under your head. Okay, yeah. Okay, and, and if it's hitting right under your head, so if you've got a, we'll make up a number, mm -hmm. a 10 degree lean, mm -hmm. okay, your head now is about a foot in front of your heel depending on how tall you are, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay? Right, right. So those of you watching video, I've got my elbow and, and my hand here, and I'm, I'm leaning it forward, so my tip of my fingers is in front of my elbow, mm -hmm. okay? The longer I am, the further that's going to be, right. right? So the taller I am, the further it's going to be. Right. Wherever my head is, I want my foot landing under that. Mm -hmm. And if that happens, if that happens, most likely now you're landing in a uh, midfoot position, mm -hmm. most likely you're landing with a, a shin that's vertical, most likely you're landing in a position that you can actually grab the ground and pull it backwards. Okay. okay. Now, if your foot's landing under your head and the heel's hitting first, I'm going to ignore the heel strike. Okay. If the shin is vertical and the heel hits first under my head, I'm going to, I'm going to ignore the heel strike because you're not overstriding. It's just making contact first, and maybe that's the best pattern for you. Mm -hmm. If we have an issue going on where you know, we've got a history of stress fractures, or we've got a history of uh, tendonitis, or we've got a history of something, well, then I might look at that a little bit more in depth. Okay. But, but I'm not automatically going to pull the, the heel strike as a bad thing here. Okay. If your foot's landing in a perfect position. Gotcha. Now, if your foot's landing in front of your head or further out away from you, mm -hmm. it's really hard not to land on your heel. Right. Yeah, I mean. And so at that point, the heel strike becomes a component, but that's an overstride. Right. You're reaching out too far, and it's not the heel strike that's the issue. It's the heel strike that's the result because they're overstriding. Mm -hmm. And so now we start talking about shortening their stride. We start talking about maybe increasing their cadence, start talking about how they're holding their body, and, and do using drills to teach that position. Mm -hmm. um, this is a good time for me to bring this analogy in, right? Yeah. Every other sport besides running has drills, mm -hmm. right? You, yeah. you go, you go play, play soccer and you've got you, fire feet and football, <laughs> right? Uh, you've got drills that they do the where they're trying to perfect technique on something. Mm -hmm. Basketball, you're going to do drills on your shot, your follow through. You're going to do all kinds of stuff in running. Yes, there are drills. There's a skips, B skips. There's all kinds of um, prancing that you can do some, uh, quick feet, things that you can do, but most people don't use those drills either appropriately or enough, mm -hmm. okay? So how, how can you run well if you don't break down the technique and work on those individual components? Right. It's really hard, mm -hmm. right? Um, most people use running as a punishment in other sports. Right, <laughs> yeah, right? yes they do. And so, and so it's, it's, or they make the assumption that, well, everybody can run, and so everybody is efficient at running, and that's mm -hmm. not true. Okay, so once we looked at where the foot is hitting, and we look at you know that being under center mass and um, making a determination whether it's a an appropriate heel strike, whether it's an appropriate um, stride length that they're not overstriding, then we start looking at their cadence. Mm -hmm. you know, how fast are they turning this over? How fast can they turn this over? What's the foot doing as it hits the ground and pulling backwards? Trying to figure out which muscles are activated, right? Are their glutes working? Now, you cannot watch somebody run and, and identify that the glutes are working. Yeah. Okay. Uh, with your eyes. Right. right. I mean, there's some electrodes you can put on. You can take them in the lab and you can see, you know, do some EMG studies, of course. But I'm talking about it. You, you're going to try to observe somebody running. You cannot tell which muscles are truly working. Mm -hmm. But you can talk to the athlete. And you can see, right. yeah. you know, do they feel like they're using their glutes? Mm -hmm. Do they feel like they're doing this stuff? And most people I talk to, they get, I ask them that question, they give, kind of give a cross-eyed look to me and go, what are you talking about? Yeah. And because they don't pay attention to that detail. They don't pay attention many times whether their core is engaged while they're running or whether they're, what position they're in. And so those details become very critical. Yeah. Let's talk about cadence just for a second. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're gonna, if you go online and you look at cadence, there's uh, everything from, you need to be a uh, cadence of 180. Mm -hmm. And they throw out that magical number. Yeah. Um, there are some sprinters that are 200, 210. Yeah. There are some 
really good marathon runners that are 155, 160. Hmm. There are some uh, really good 5K individuals who are, you know, running a 15-minute 5K and their cadence is 158. Yeah. You know, that's an actual case study of one of our members. I won't point that individual out, but <laughs> we're going to uh, raise that cadence up and we're going to go for a 1430. Yeah. Um, I'm going to stop you real quick. Can you explain, can you define cadence for those that don't know, that may not run? Yeah. So there's two ways of looking at cadence. If you can look at your right or left foot and count how many times it hits. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if we're talking about just one foot hitting, well, that, and we're talking about, a, I would tell you to use a 90. Mm -hmm. If you're counting both feet, that'd be a 180 cadence. Okay. So cadence, you know, some people will look at it, you know, how many times is my right foot hitting or my left foot hitting? And that becomes, you know, trying to get to that magical 90. Mm -hmm. I look at both feet. For yeah. how long? Yeah, within a minute. Okay. So, you know, trying to get uh, three steps per second mm -hmm. is really what it is. And, and unless you're doing a really slow recovery, which most of us don't do enough of, mm -hmm. uh, a really slow aerobic piece, which most of us don't do enough of, mm -hmm. um, your cadence She's not talking be, about me, by the way. <laughs> you're, you're, maybe. <laughs> your, your cadence should be in that regu regular 180-ish place. And, and, and again, I want to, that 180 is a magical number that people use. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I try to get people there sometimes. Sometimes I'm like, you're good at 167. You're good at 172. And that becomes your magical number. There are some people that I'm, hey, you're already 180. Uh, I think you're better off at 185, 190, you know, 195. And uh, there's a, uh, people, please don't use that 180 as you've got to get there and try to get there really fast. If you're at a 150, that's a really bad mistake to make. So <laughs> let's talk about how to get you there. Yeah. But that cadence, um, if you have a higher cadence in general, you're less likely to have a high vertical oscillation. Mm -hmm. You're less likely to be jumping in the air. Yeah. Okay. Um, let, let's go back to um, when you were really young and you're in kindergarten and they've got you and you're jumping, you try to see how far you can jump in the air from one leg to the other. Mm -hmm. You're jumping up into the air really high, you're landing on the other foot. That's a really high vertical oscillation, but you can't do that very fast. No, right. You can't do that very fast. Right. When you bring that vertical oscillation down, you can turn it over a lot faster. Mm -hmm. You're more efficient, you don't have as much force, uh, negatively impacting the body, and you're just gonna be more efficient. Mm -hmm. So if you're over striding, your foot's not hitting under your center mass. It's not hitting under your head. Yeah, and we pull that foot back, mm -hmm. you're gonna have to increase your cadence. Right. If you increase your cadence, initially it's gonna feel really awkward because yeah, you're that, running yeah. differently. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't feel awkward, you haven't changed anything. Right, right, yeah. Okay, That's and so correct. I have yep. a lot of people, I'll change something and they'll be like, but this feels so awkward. And I'll celebrate with them and say, That's great. Mm -hmm. It should feel really awkward. Yeah. You know, we've got to teach you a new normal. Right. Um, it's just important to be aware. Absolutely. No, I mean, I think about all that stuff on my run. Even today, I'm thinking about it no matter what. Um, from cadence, though, where do we go to? Well, then where we got to talk about how, how you're pushing off, right? And so mm -hmm. we've, we've alluded to this a little bit. Yep. Um, and, you know, we've talked about the vertical oscillation. Your drive angle mm -hmm. or the angle that your body is propelling itself off the ground. Okay. Okay. The steeper that is, the more vertical that is, mm -hmm. the, the higher your drive angle is. Yeah. You want to have a lower drive angle. You want to be pushing back, not down. Okay. Okay. And so as, as they're pushing off or they're running, you know, whether on a treadmill or outside, uh, if you watch the hips or the shoulders and it bounces up, well, their drive angle is off, mm -hmm. right? So we want to make that pull off more. So there's some drills that we can do to get them to push back versus pushing down. Mm -hmm. Does how how important is foot placement with that then? Because so if I have someone that has a foot instead of facing forward and it's going this way, what what am I doing? Yeah, so this way you've got it rotated out. So mm -hmm. if if their foot is you know, like a little duck walk kind mm -hmm. of position, yeah, um, they're rolling through their arch and they're just not getting any power off their foot. Okay, right. So that's not an issue with the cadence or the drive angle so much as if they're not able to use their Achilles and their big toe to push off as okay. they're rolling in the arch. And so that would be something usually coming out of the hip that they've got a tight muscle on the outside, uh, IT band or 
piriformis or one of the glutes are, are too tight. And it's rotating the hip, pulling the toes outward. You kind of balance that so the foot comes back and, and lines up with the direction they're running. Mm -hmm. So now they can roll across the ball of their foot and actually use the muscles more effectively. Okay. So, yeah. Gotcha. So that's less about the drive angle and, and more about the good biomechanics that we were talking about earlier. Okay. okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So we want to correct all that before we even got into some mm -hmm. of these pieces. Okay. The drive angle, and, and you asked a really good question, uh, and, and where I thought you were going to go is, is the position of the foot. So if they're pushing down right. with their uh, Achilles and their big toe pushing off the ground and the foot's underneath of them, mm -hmm. they're going to be pushing themselves into the air. Right, yeah. If they can put that foot behind them a little further, now they're more likely to be pushing backwards. Mm -hmm. right? Well, yeah. And so that limitation, saying. if they're if they're not able to get their foot behind their body, mm -hmm. right, because their hip flexor is too too tight, they can't push off back there. They can't reach back there far enough. Well, then we need to lengthen those hip flexors. Okay. Get them to you know, either be less active, mm -hmm. so they can you know be more relaxed and. and recoil back there gotcha. or or we've just got to put them on a table and stretch them and, and get that mm -hmm. muscle on there okay but if if they do have a, a high vertical oscillation maybe it's coming from tight hip flexors if you can't get it back maybe it's coming from poor timing over the pushing off maybe it's coming because they've got poor mechan biomechanics as we talked about before gotcha okay so pause real quick everybody i know we're throwing a lot of information at you we're we're hitting some of these pieces, and, and sometimes it's going to sound confusing as you're um, trying to put all these pieces together. It is very confusing. Mm -hmm. it, there is a lot of data to look at being an efficient runner. Yep. You know, um, if you look at these elite level runners, you know they're doing drills a lot more than they're doing training, if you will. Mm -hmm. Their drills become part of their training because of how important that is. Right. On the elite level side, you know these guys are trying to compete in like for. Uh, points of a percent mm -hmm. of improvement. You know, you and I, if we make a 5% gain, that's, you know, sometimes pretty easy for us because of, of where we're at it and, and how far away we are from perfection in our, in our running career. Right. On the elite level, some of these things are just minute micro changes mm -hmm. um, that play big roles in those. Right, right. no, absolutely. For sure. sure. Cool. So um, from the drive angle, what we got? Yep. So uh, um, this is similar. We'll look at the vertical ratios, you mm -hmm. know, how high are they bouncing? So the angle affects that, but what's the result? It's how high are they, are they really going and, and what, what role does that play? You know, that, that prancer that you were talking about or the gazelle mm -hmm. that you saw running, yep. that might be good mechanics for her. Mm -hmm. I doubt it. Right. <laughs> and I mean, we might want to bring that down a little bit, but maybe. Okay, mm -hmm. so, you know, just because we see somebody with a higher vertical oscillation, I don't tend to make the judgment or the assumption that we need to bring that down automatically. Mm -hmm. Now, the lower it is, the better. The, the lower it is, the uh, less likely she is to get hurt, the more efficient she's going to be, all those things that are going on for sure. But we can't just make those automatic spaces. Yeah. The other thing is the, the angle, ankle, angles of the ankle, mm -hmm. or the ankle angles. Mm -hmm. That's not, it's not uh, so easy to say. It's not. I'm it not going to say it. I'm not going to repeat it. So. <laughs> it should be. I'm going to let you mess up. <laughs> yeah. But, but the angles of the ankle become important, right? So, you know, if if you have a limitation in your ankle range of motion or your Achilles mm -hmm. flexibility yeah. or your big toe flexibility, you can't get it behind you as far. Right. Okay. So it's going to affect that drive angle. It's going to affect that vertical ratio. And so we've been stick, sticking uh, and around on the foot and the, and the ankle for a long time now. It's mm -hmm. been many minutes that we've been chit-chatting about this. Mm -hmm. um, that's how important the biomechanics of the ankle and foot are yeah. on that propulsion. Let's move up a little bit. Okay. Let's, let's talk about um, uh, glute firing sequence or, or the firing sequence from your, your hips down. Okay. Okay, we were talking about earlier how I asked people, can they feel their glutes working and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Here's what I want to know. I want to know, can they feel their glutes fire? That should initiate most of the motion. Their hamstrings are going to fire. They should fire second. Mm -hmm. their, your calf needs to fire. Your Achilles needs to fire third. And then finally, your big toe needs to push you off the ground. Yeah. Okay. If you get them firing in that order, glutes, hamstring, calf, big toe, 
usually have a really good whipping type effect, an efficient sequence, a, a good really motor. Good. You know, uh, whipping really good, run really well. Um, but you get that um, motor firing sequence that happens well. If you can make it happen uh, effectively for you where it feels normal, mm -hmm. you're going to be more efficient, you're going to be more powerful, you're going to be running faster. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, there are people who run really fast, who run really I'm going to call it well, because we're looking at their time and their performance. Yeah. Their glutes don't work at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so they might be running fast, but they could run faster yeah. if they made some of these minor changes. Mm -hmm. Now, I say minor changes. Some of these things are not easy to fix. No, they're not. They're not, they're not easy to fix. Um, and you sometimes have to relearn how to make those things happen. When should you do that relearning? <laughs> As you're doing a training plan? Probably not. Early in your training plan, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But if you're deep into how you're training and you're trying to change mechanics and do your training, that's a recipe for getting hurt. Right. No, yeah, I agree. I was just thinking either yesterday or today about like now is the time that you should be working on this stuff. Um, if or, you, or last month. <laughs> or, well, yeah, or last month. Um, so and because I was just thinking with because I'm working on my glute firing. Um, so that I can get them to fire properly for when I run. So I'm like, I'm literally laying in bed and walking around the house doing it all the time. I'm like, boom, can I get it to go? Can I get it to go? You know, doing the blinking and winking that you talk about. Um, so, <laughs> and so I isolate it, right? Like I'm, I'm literally laying in bed and I'm doing this. <laughs> and so I'm always thinking in my head, I wonder like if someone was here, if they'd probably think I'm super weird. Um, but that's just how much, you know, it takes to work on it so that you can right. well, try let, to Let's talk better. about the winking and blinking real quick, real quick so we <laughs> don't leave everybody thinking any abnormal thoughts. <laughs> if you uh, lay on your stomach on a flat surface mm -hmm. and, and, and you're going to try to engage your back pockets, get yeah. your glutes to fire, if you do both of them at the same time, that's like blinking, mm -hmm. right? So if you take your eyes and close them at the same time, you're blinking. Right. If you do right and then left or left and then right, that's like closing one eye then the other. That's called winking. Right. And so the, what he's talking about is a, is a drill that we use or a, an activation that we use to see if we can get the glutes to fire before the hamstrings. We start with blinking. Mm -hmm. And then once you get blinking under control, then you try to isolate right and left and get them to work independently or go into some winking. Right. So, no, I just wanted to bring that up because it's like something that always needs to be worked on. and. Um, like you said, now is the time to do it or last month, but so. And, and, and maybe it comes, becomes part of your drill, maybe it becomes part of your activation before you run, you know, your warm up piece, you know, how do you get into those things? Um, maybe it's part of your maintenance. Yeah. And again, that's, these are all things that, you know, we, we keep recycling back to similar themes. Um, it, I think it's unrealistic for people to think that they can automatically go out and be a good runner. Mm -hmm. They might be performing well or having a time that's better than someone else, that doesn't make them a good runner. Right, right, for sure. So as we move up up a little bit now, we've talked about that glute firing sequence, you know, the glutes, the hamstrings, and then the calf and the, and the, the big toe. If you're watching somebody run, the faster they go, the higher the heel should recover toward your glute, mm -hmm. or the more the knee should be bending. So I watch people shuffle. Yeah. They go out and they're uh, doing their jog and their feet barely get off the ground. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, The higher you get that heel off the ground, the more likely you are to be running well. Okay. okay? So you're bending your knee as it, after it's pushed off the ground, that heel comes up, the hamstrings are contracted, it comes up, it follows through, and then it let, foot lands right underneath your body again and repeats that cycle. Gotcha. So if you're out there running and, and you're looking, looking down for the moment, yeah, as opposed to looking out that 20 or 30 feet, but you look and you see that your heel isn't coming but six inches off the ground, you're not running, you're shuffling. Yeah. Um, maybe we'll call that a jog to make us feel better. <laughs> okay. Um, but you're not running. Mm -hmm. Getting that heel to pop up behind you and getting it to turn over and being more efficient is something else for you to look at. Yeah. Okay. That's not something that I would, that would be first on my list to change, but it's something on the list to be aware of. Okay. Next is looking at your torso, uh, mm -hmm. torso and hips. So if we're looking at your pelvis here, and as soon as you put your foot down, the opposite hip drops, mm -hmm. you've got a hip drop, which means that your core is not engaging. It's either you're not activating your 
abdominal muscles. It could be that your uh, glute medius or your IT band or your uh, the muscle in your lower back called uh, quadratus lumborum or QL. It's just a muscle in your lower back that's stabilizing your core that would allow that pelvis to drop. It doesn't matter what the cause is, but if you've got a hip drop, you're going to get hurt. Okay. If you've got a history of IT band issues or lateral um, hip pain or one of those pieces along the outsides, you most likely have a hip drop going on. So fix that, less likely to be sore and injured. Mm -hmm. Fix that, you're more like, likely to be a steel rod. Fix that, you're going to be faster. Yep. Okay, more efficient. Absolutely. We'll, we'll use more efficient. You know, okay. Speed is, is a relative term. Yes. Another thing to look at is what are your shoulders doing? Mm -hmm. What are your arms doing, right? So if you're running and you're uh, looking down at your hands and your hands are crossing over your body, well, that most likely means that your trunk is twisting or rotating. Mm -hmm. We want to minimize that. Uh, we want your elbows to be at about a 90 degree angle. We want your hands relaxed. We want everything moving front to back. Anything you do that is not front to back, okay, assuming you're not turning while you're running, but, it, but it's not front to back, it's taking away from your performance. Mm -hmm. So why is that? Because, well, so the answer is because we're moving, we want because to go forward. forward. Right. So if you've, so. Got, if you've got forces going side to side, whether it's a hip drop, mm -hmm. whether it's a upper body rotation, whether it's that foot that's rolled out, mm -hmm. whether it's your head leaning forward, your chin is lifted up, all those things take away from what you're trying to do in terms of moving forward. Yep, absolutely. No, that's what I wanted you to say because I got to tell that to people all the time. Yeah. And so those are the things that we, we look at, right? So we, we look at the body position. We look at, you know, do they have the biomechanics to do these pieces? And then those two pieces are the most critical. Mm -hmm. Then if you got a flaw in there, then we got to figure out what, what the cause of that flaw is. Yep. And, and all the other things that we talk about are potential causes to one of those flaws. Right. Right. Where your foot's striking, mm -hmm. whether you've got a high vertical oscillation, whether you're pushing off, whether you have the right drive angle, whether you have the, uh, a good amount of flexibility in your ankle or in your foot, mm -hmm. whether you've got a good knee bend on your follow through, whether you're crossing over with your arms, whether you've got a hip drop, those become details that affect the overall performance. Yep. The overall risk of injury. Yes, sir. No, that was all good information. I think. They, I feel like this was the most informative podcast that we've done. Not that that's a bad thing. Um, so yeah. At, at this point, if, if if people have questions or people are starting to cross their eyes because we get given a lot of uh, didactic information on this, and sometimes mm -hmm. it's really hard to visualize. Well, this is the time to come in and see us. Right? Yep. We're, we're getting started on our training plans. You've got this question. Maybe you've got a, a history of injuries. Maybe you just want to be faster. Uh, and let's work on those biomechanics so that as your training does increase, you're not as likely to get hurt and you're going to take advantage of all the things that, that you should be doing in your training. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's where <clears throat> you should definitely come in. And I think um, you're starting the education series soon then. Yeah, we're going to, um, we've done it usually starting in the second week of January. We're, we may be into the third week of January before we get everything organized. But we're going to have Saturday morning education where we're going to come in and we'll have a, a similar lecture like this about your run form. We'll have a little lab that would follow so we can, people can ask questions and we can demonstrate some things. We'll do the same thing with the swim technique. We'll do the same thing with, with cycling. Uh, we'll talk about transitions in one of them. We'll talk about bike maintenance in another. And so there's a whole series of uh, educational pieces that uh, our listeners should pay attention uh, expect uh, to see more information there. Awesome. Okay. Well, cool. Well, I hope to see everyone at those. Um, I'm going to go ahead and segment into our fun stuff. The fun stuff. <laughs> yeah, the fun stuff. So today I'm starting a new segment and it is the unpopular opinion segment um, because the, I had a conversation with the family and they're going to be my shout out for today because I said I would give it to them. Um, and so the unpopular opinion is a question that I'm going to ask you, and it is, do you make your bed every morning? No. Okay. Do you think it, you should make your bed every morning? Well, I've seen a lot of, uh, what they call them? They're, uh, motivational speakers yep. who talk about the, the 
importance of making your bed mm -hmm. every morning and how that sets a lot of things in motion in your life. Right. So I'll go, I'll go with them and say, yes, it's mm -hmm. a great theory. Do I do it? No. Right. Is there, do you think that everyone needs to do it? Everyone needs to, yeah, do yeah. it. So now you're going to see, you know, now you're going to see more of my opinion. No, I don't think everybody needs to. I think that mm -hmm. everybody uh, might consider it yep. and see how it applies to their world. Right. That, and that's what I said, because so I don't make my bed either. And, so, and this is how the conversation got started, um, because they were talking to one of their kids about making um, her bed. And I was like, well, the funny thing is, is that I actually don't make mine either. But then so my thing was the rest of my house is clean, like my dishes are clean, my laundry's done, my room's picked up, like my closet is actually all in alignment. Um, all that kind of stuff. So that's where I was like, I was arguing somewhat in the kids' favor, which was unfortunate in this case, just because I was like, you know, I think it's more efficient for me to not have my bed made. Well, so. and I do think that, you know, the, for adolescents and juniors and that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. that we're teaching discipline and we're teaching uh, habits. Yep. I think it becomes a, a critical Right. I, mean, I can remember, you know, growing up that uh, making my bed and having it uh, presentable mm -hmm. was something that uh, was encouraged of me uh, quite often. Yeah, same here, and I agree. Like, I it teaches discipline, and if you need the um, accomplishment thing, where it, so the motivational speakers they say like that's your first accomplishment of the day, then go ahead and do it. But I just said, you know, I have a different way of doing that, and. I argued that I was disciplined in others yeah. and everything else. Yeah, so, so it's definitely going to be an unpopular opinion. It's mm -hmm. interesting to see if we get any uh, feedback on that about our opinion. I'm so happy you <laughs> said no. I, I am so happy you said no. So I'm going to go into our shout out segment then. Um, shout out to the Fords for me. So that's where that question came from to see if Paul made his bed or not. Um, the Ford family, I was over there the, I think last week, yeah, last week sometime. Um, and I'm gonna shout them out for beating me at ping pong. Um, we played ping pong for quite a while, and um, CC, JB, they both beat me. And then um, Sarah did not beat me, thank the Lord. I would have never heard the end of that. So, um, but shout out to them, and then we played doubles and whatnot and got different wins. I was probably the worst one there, to be honest. So they said I need to practice on that. Um, so shout out to them and their family. You have anyone you wanna shout out today? It's a new year, so uh, there's been a lot of people in, the, in class in the last couple of weeks that have really worked really hard. We, it's been a, a challenge. You know, that place all of them of being able to be consistent through the holidays, of getting all the travels done, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, those individuals, uh, that was a lot of work, a lot of discipline. Well done. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's always fun to see. Um, okay, cool. So then that's it for this. I um, want to go into the conclusion then and thank everyone who's left a rating and review so far. So we're up to nine ratings on Apple. Uh, we have those are all five star reviews uh, or ratings, I should say, as they call them. And then we have um, a couple reviews on there. I would encourage everyone to continue leaving reviews and ratings on Spotify, on Apple, on uh, you can't on YouTube, but you can like it on YouTube. Um, and let us know if you haven't listened to the last podcast. I think our last one is going to be our most popular one this far. Um, go listen to it. It's with uh, Sarah Galvin, actually. Um, it's actually taken off quite a bit, and so I think that's super cool for her. Um, just to see that and for all of um, the people that she knows to see that um, so go leave a review and let us know how awesome she is and it was your favorite one and all that fun stuff so uh, we're steadily growing uh, we have over 600 st streams now or plays or listens however you want to say it we're in four different continents which is pretty awesome uh, shout out to not only the general area around where we are in the indianapolis area um, so Carmel, Westfield, Fisher, Zionsville, all you people, shout out to all of you. Um, but then shout out to Kansas. <laughs> so we have some, uh, our, I would say top, well definitely top five listen to places is in, um, around Wichita, Kansas. So rock chalk. 
Yeah. So, and then if everyone, if anyone wants to sponsor the podcast, feel free to reach out to Paul or I. You can have an advertisement on here um, or on social media, whatever you want. Um, we can work it out for you. And then always, you can find the, you can always find the podcast on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, Google Podcasts, all that fun stuff. So, happy New Year, everyone! Share the podcast with a friend. I hope everyone celebrates and has an awesome 2023. And that's it from me. Happy Paul. New Year, everybody. If you need help with your running, I'd love to hear from you. Absolutely.